grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. And let us pray. Thank you, Father, for this day of worship. May our worship be filled with joy and our hearts filled with wonder as we marvel at the holiness and grace. Speak to us this morning through your word. Strengthen us to do your will, that the name of Jesus, your son, may be glorified. In his name we pray. Amen. The first reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 9 through 17 and 21 through 22. Concerning the prophets, my heart is crushed within me. All my bones shake. I have become like a drunkard, like one overcome by wine, because of the Lord and because of his holy words. For the land is full of adulterers, because of the curse the land mourns, and the pastures of the wilderness are dried up. Their course has been evil, and their might is not right. Both prophet and priest are ungodly. Even in my house I have found their wickedness, says the Lord. Therefore their... Their way shall be to them like slippery paths in the darkness, into which they shall be driven and fall. For, for I will bring disaster upon them in the year of their punishment, says the Lord. In the prophets of Samaria I saw a disgusting thing. They prophesied, prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray. But in the prophets, prophets of Jerusalem I have seen a more shocking thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns from wickedness. All of them have become like Sodom to me, and, in it, and its inhabitants like Gomorrah. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, I am going to make them eat wormwood and give them poisoned water to drink. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, ungodliness has spread throughout the land. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They are deluding you. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise the word of the Lord, It shall be well with you, and to all who stubbornly follow their own stubborn heart. They say, No calamity shall come upon you. I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words, to my people, and they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. The word of the Lord. The second reading comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 19. Of course there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world, so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and for which you made the good confession, in the presence of many witnesses, in the presence of God who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. It is he along, alone who has immortality and dwells in an unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and, inter and internal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the, the life that really is life, the word of the Lord. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. 
The Pharisees who loved, loved money heard all this, and they were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are ones who justify yourself in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. And then the parable. There was, verse 19, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. At the time, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades where he was in torment. He looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Then he answered, Then I beg you, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so they will not come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of our God. Back in uh, 1980, there was a man named Harry Randall Truman. This is not the President Truman. This was a different Harry Randall Truman. And he lived in Washington, and he lived in a beautiful location. He had a beautiful lodge that he owned, and and he was on side of a, a brilliant lake called Spirit Lake. And the lake was so brilliant you could see this huge snow-capped mountain uh, reflecting off the lake. The area uh, began in 1980 to have some tremors and, and earthquakes. And one earthquake was so severe that it literally knocked uh, Harry right out of his bed on, onto the floor. And Harry's solution, he moved his bed into the basement. Scientists started to study the area because they were very alarmed. They came to the conclusion that the mountain where Harry lived next to uh, was about to explode. And so they had the state uh, issue orders to evacuate that entire area. Well, Harry was an uh, elderly, uh, older man and very stubborn, and he refused to move. That mountain wasn't going to explode. He told reporters the danger of a volcano was greatly exaggerated. This area is heavily timbered, he told them. Spirit Lake is between me and the mountain, and the mountain is a mile away. That mountain ain't going to hurt me, boys, he told his reporters. He lived in blissful ignorance, uh, complete unawareness, or probably even more than that, denial of the danger that he was in. And on May 18th, Mount St. Helen exploded, sending literally a cubic mile of Parsley molten rock and hot gas is flying 600 miles an hour towards Spirit Lake. And in less than a few seconds, Harry was covered by 150 feet of volcanic de debris. He died within seconds. Jesus' story is directed likewise to those living in blissful uh, ignorance, completely unaware of the danger they face, one heartbeat away from facing God and judgment and they didn't love God. He directed this to the religious Pharisees, to the self-righteous Pharisees, uh, who were sneering at him when Jesus told, man cannot serve two masters, you cannot serve God and money. What did this Jesus know? They were rich, they loved money, they sometimes were a little dishonest to get it, and this Jesus had nothing, he was poor. What does he know? So they sneered at him. And so Jesus told them this story of a rich man who goes to hell and a miserably poor beggar who goes to heaven. 
First, we have the two men. It uh, starts out with the unnamed rich man. There was a rich man dressed in purple and fine linen, lived in luxury every day, and at his gate was named a beggar Lazarus. The rich man is unnamed. Sometimes he's given the name Dives because in the uh, Latin Bible, the word uh, for rich man is Dives. But he's unnamed. There's no name given to him. No doubt he represents the Pharisees. The, la uh, the beggar is named the rich man lives in absolute luxury. We can picture all kinds of servants, all kinds, even cooks. He could have whatever he wanted, and it would be at his fingertip. The poor beggar is starving. He would even willing to eat what fell off on the floor. He is so hungry. He's also sick, and no one is paying any attention to him. The, only the dogs take pity on him. The dogs come and they lick his sores. I remember I uh, had a skit where I had uh, junior high kids act this out. And the dogs just love their job in the skit. But the man is an other impoverished beggar, dismal poverty and health. Two men, two destinations. We're told they both died and there was a great reversal. The time came when the beggar died. And the angels carried him to Abraham's side. They carried him to for Father Abraham uh, was in heaven. Both men, by the way, were children of Abraham. Both men were born as part of God's covenantal family. And the, and, and the beggar was a believer, and they carried him to heaven where Abraham was. And we're told the rich die, man also died and was buried. And in Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. Two destinations. Jesus always spoke very, very clearly about judgment. He never joked about hell. I really don't like the joke about hell because we need to take God's judgment seriously. It's amazing that the church through the century has said, he shall come again to judge the living and dead. And yet we have people who claim to be part of that tradition, part of that faith, and you never hear about God's judgment. Jesus never pulled any punches talking about God's judgment. There's two destinations. He consistently taught that. Sermon on the Mount, Mount Matthew 7. Jesus uh, commanded us, enter through the narrow gate. The gate is narrow because it's one person. It's Jesus Christ. It's the cross. It's through faith and repentance. And there's no other way. It's narrow. And he says, enter through the narrow gate. For the way, the wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only few find it. Two destinations, either destruction or life, either with God's people on Abraham's side or in Hades, in hell. Both the rich men, by the way, continued, and the uh, Lazarus continued to exist. The Bible teaches that we have an eternal soul, and at death the body dies. Our body goes back to the earth, but the soul goes to God, and that God judges us, and those who believe come to God, and those who don't, go to a place of sorrow and regret. Most of this parable, actually about two-thirds, it's spent Jesus telling about the regret of the rich man, about the sorrow. That's most of the parable. First of all, he attempts to get some relief from his great suffering, verse 24. So he called to him, the rich man, called to Father Abraham, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Mmm, God, that tastes good. I have allergies, and so my throat is almost always dry. Can you imagine being in such agony that that would bring comfort? Jesus is always very honest about hell and, and judgment. Abraham replied, 
son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus is bad, but now he is comforted here. You are in agony, and besides all this between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, and those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. In other words, you're given this lifetime whether you're going to follow God or not. You're not going to have a second chance. You need to decide in this lifetime if you're going to believe what God wrote in the scripture and if you're going to follow Jesus. You're not going to have a second chance. When you die, there's judgment immediately. The problem with the rich man is he didn't repent. He needed to repent. He didn't need to repent because of his wealth. The problem wasn't his that he was wealthy. His sin was not being wealthy. His sin was he loved money more than he loved God. And he loved money even more than he loved his fellow man. Listen to what the word of the Lord says, summing up the commandments. Deuteronomy 6. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And this man does not love God. He loved money. He loved luxury. And that's where his trust was. Jesus repeats this, Luke 10. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Neither did he love his neighbor. Here the rich man had Lazarus at his gate. Lazarus who had just been happy just to get the crumbs left on the rich man's uh, uh, plate or left that fell from the table, and no one would give him anything. Get rid of this beggar. Call the police. I don't want him. He's disgusting. He needed to repent. He needed to turn to God and put God first. Now, he was a child of Abraham. He was a son of Abraham. He was born a Jew. But the fact that that does not make him right with God, the Pharisee thought, we're children of Abraham. We're okay. And that's what this rich man thought. Some people treat God as a good luck charm. They say they believe in God. They want him around like they carry a good luck charm. But he's not in their life. He's just around just in case things get bad and just in case they need him. And all of a sudden, they snap their fingers and God is supposed to be there. He's there if they need him. But he's not in their life. And that's the way it was with this man. This man accepted the teaching of Pharisees rather than the teaching of the word of God. Remember, Jesus was directing this at the Pharisees. The Pharisees loved money, and they sneered at Jesus, telling them that they can serve both God and money. They loved money, and they believed that if you had money and if you had the wealth of this world, that that was a sign that you were white with God. Isn't that amazing, that teaching has come back? There's only one sign that you're right with God, and that's in if you repent and if you believe and you love God. That's the only sign that, you're, that if you're right with God, not worldly riches. But they believed this false teaching, and, and he believed it, and so he refused to repent. A few, quite a few years back, I heard this story about two women who had uh, attended a Billy Graham crusade. And as a uh, Billy preached, they felt conviction for their sins. And so they went forward and, and they experienced a forgiveness for their sins. They came back to their church and their pastor told them uh, that they were members of his church and they were right with God because they were members of his church and they don't need to repent. We all need to repent. Jesus says, unless you repent, you will perish. And the man didn't think he needed to repent. The good news is there's hope available. There's hope available. As Jesus told them this parable, he pointed forward that, one, that he would go to that cross and he would rise from the dead. But second, verse 27, I skipped over this. The rich man uh, was now concerned about his family. I beg you, Father Abraham, 
for I have five brothers. Let them warn them so they will not come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, if they do not listen to the word of God, if they do not listen to the Bible, neither will they be convinced if someone rises from the dead. Jesus spoke these words knowing full well that he was going to that cross and he would pay for our sins and he would rise from the dead. I love the song you sang this morning, Pardon for Sin and a peace that endureth. If you turn to the one on the cross, that's what we have. We have pardon. Our sins are no more. And we don't have a temporary peace. We have a peace with God that endureth until the day that God takes us home. We may have tribulation in the world, but our peace with God endureth and that's found only in the person of Jesus Christ and it's not found in the goodness and the self-righteousness of the Pharisees and it's not found in believing the false teaching of this world it's found in the scripture and it's found in Jesus Christ as I think about this story of Jesus I am reminded of our need and our urgency we need to have to tell others the good news of Jesus Christ, to don't let them sleep in blissful ignorance. Too often, I think we preachers tell people what to do. I think we need to start telling them how to do it. This past week, we had a, a week of vacation, and uh, Sunday went to, uh, actually went to uh, the churches I had been at previously and visited them. And a couple took us out to, a friend's, friends took us out to dinner, paid for our dinner, that was really nice. And the gentleman said, you know, I have trouble explaining the gospel. I think there was always a lot of fear that we may not get it right. And I said, you know, a lot of times when I explain the gospel, I just use John 3.16. You all know John 3.16. And I explain John 3.16. I tell them, God so loved the world. God loves you and me. He's not talking about trees and mountains and camels and horses. He's talking about the world of people. God loves you and me. God so loved the world and he loved us so much he gave his only begotten son. The son of God left heaven and came to earth. And he came on a mission of salvation. He came to be my savior. God loved me so much, he gave his son to die on the cross for my sins. And he died on the cross for your sins. You see, our sins were so serious in God's sight, there was no other way that we could have forgiveness if God himself would pay for them. And that's the only way we can have forgiveness. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You see, whosoever, the door is open for anyone that would come to Christ. Doesn't make any difference how bad your sins are. If you would just simply come to him and believe in him. To believe in him means to admit that you are a sinner. It means to trust Jesus to save you. And then I usually lead them, do you believe in the scriptures? Yes. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Yes. Do you believe he's the son of God? Yes. Do you believe he died for your sins? Yes. Have you asked Jesus to forgive your sins and to be your Lord? Have you trusted in him to save you? Okay, yes, I do now. Then what does this say about you? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, you believe in him, whosoever believes in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. What does that say about you? Well, I have eternal life. You know, the gospel is not a hard message. 
you don't need to have a PhD or a THD and, or all these advanced degrees that explain it. Sometimes if you have all these advanced degrees, it makes it harder to explain the gospel because you think you have to put all this technical language in. They don't need to know about transubstantiation to be saved. All they need to know is about Jesus. And we need to tell them about Jesus. The awesome thing is the gospel is the power of God for salvation. It has the power to turn a sinner into a saint. It has the power to turn an enemy of God into a child of God. And that's awesome to see. And it has the power to change your life. Let's bow our heads. What a wonderful Savior you are, that you would love me so much, that you would go to that cross for me. I have to confess, Lord, I did not deserve any of what you did for me. You did it out of mercy. You did it out of pure grace and love. Thank you, Lord, that you made me a child of God. It was all your doing. Thank you, God, for people who spoke the gospel to me. And Lord, may we speak the gospel to, to all that are around us. Give us open doors. Make this church a lighthouse for this community, a lighthouse that points to Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. You have heard God's word. Let us confess our faith in the words of the, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us see our shortcomings, our ignorance, help us and guide us to follow your Son. Remind us, Lord, uh, that as... How we treat others is a reflection of our relationship with you. Let your Holy Spirit guide us that we may know your grace and your forgiveness. Lord, and your, your mercy. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.